the nudge department. What is it? And why is it important? Well, if you know where to look, then you'll see it pop up everywhere. I kind of touched on it earlier when I did a podcast with Professor Matthias Desmet. Professor Matthias Desmet became famous during COVID because he introduced the idea of mass formation. It was also coined mass formation psychosis, but he doesn't like that. But that's beside the point. But in his um, in his treatise, in his theory, in his book, The Psychology of Totalitarianism, which is an excellent book, and you should go and watch that podcast. It's really it's one of my favorites, um, but it's a really interesting uh, take on what's happening. And basically, you know, he, he put forward the idea that mass formation is part of psychological operations carried on um, since the war and used to manipulate populations. And a classic mass formation was COVID. And they were able to execute that mass formation almost perfectly at the beginning um, without us, you know, rebels resisting and blowing the whistle and uh, shouting from the rooftops that we knew what was going on. Now, um, once obviously once COVID was over and people started to forget about mass formation, but the nudge unit, which was probably responsible to some degree largely for the mass formation during COVID, that was emboldened, right? And that was um, from the success that happened during COVID, they're now using it in lots of various scenarios. For instance, if we look at nudge in the news, so what they, they, they're not shy about telling you <laughs> when they're nudging. So net zero and behavior change. That's the key understanding with nudge is that what they're trying to do is use psychology, hidden psychology, implicit beneath the surface that you don't know what's happening in order to change your behavior. They're trying to nudge you in a direction. Um, and what they're doing here is how to build a green choice environment. So what they're doing is trying to nudge us into this whole net zero, 15 minute cities, all of these things that we're seeing at the moment are part of the nudge unit and the psychological operation against the population. Um, yeah, so we don't need to go any further with that. Um, yeah, so what is nudge? Where did it come from? And um, what's the, the history of it, the background? Well, it first came about after the Second World War, um, because of all of the, there was still some kind of group psychology, crowd psychology in the early part of the 20th century, but it really came to its own just after the Second World War. And it was called social psychology. And what they were trying to discover was why people complied, why people were obedient to authoritarianism, why they just went along with it. What was the psychological makeup of people that caused that to happen? And initially it was um, a field of study, or so they tell us, that wanted to find out about how to increase people's freedom and liberty and not be caught up in this authoritarian obedience so that atrocities are committed during that kind of obedience. So this was, uh, for all intents and purposes, a, a way of trying to understand the psychology that ha that caused that and how to re resolve it. Um, so up until the 50s and the 60s is that nudge was, it was still called social psychology. And then in the 2000s, social psychology was hijacked by the oligarchs and the plutocrats and the people who realized that they could make big money from the people they realized that they could make big money from understanding how this worked and how they could use the, the insight that came from these studies to um, make more money and grab more power and do all the things that these elites and these plutocrats and these oligarchs do. And then um, it was during this period, one of the things that came out of this study uh, into social psychology with two experiments that are very famous. One's the Milgram experiment in which people are given electric shocks because they're told to give the electric shocks to the subject. And it was a really unusual finding. But the important one is the Stanford prison experiment in where 
two sets of students are taken into the basement of Stanford University. They make a mock prison, give roles to each group. One's the prison guards, one's the prisoners, and they left them to it. And then something like 24 hours, 48 hours, 36 hours, the, the situation had turned so dark and weird that they had to call an end to it because the prison guards began to abuse the prisoners, even though it was just role play. And it got quite serious and the abuse got quite heavy. And I think they had to call it off. But one of the results of that was that they created something called informed consent. And informed consent was that because the students who entered into the experiment didn't know what the experiment was really about and what was really gonna, gonna happen, they were subject to abuse, torture, violence, and they didn't know that that was going to be an outcome of the experiment. So uh, ethics determined that moving forward, when you do things like that, you have to have informed consent. You have to know what you're putting yourself into. And that was um, one of the great things that came out of that experiment. But here's one of the people who were in it and listen to him quick. I, I had really thought that I was incapable of this kind of behavior. I. I was surprised, you know, I was dismayed to find out that I could, uh, I could really be a, uh, <laughs> that I could uh, act in a uh, manner so, so absolutely unaccustomed to anything I would even really dream of doing. And I, <laughs> and while I was doing it, I, uh, I didn't feel any regret. I didn't feel any. Uh, uh, guilt. It was only after, afterwards, when I began to reflect on what I had done that this began to, this behavior began to dawn on me, and I realized that this was, uh, uh, this was a part of me I hadn't really noticed before. So this is someone who went along with the mass formation. Yeah, he didn't know why he did, he just did, and he went along with it, and he carried out atrocities, and he carried out all things that he never, ever presumed that he had the capability of doing, right? And it was a really important experiment to understand, you know, how certain humans can be manipulated to do atrocities. And these people aren't psychopaths. That's what's even more scary about it. They're just ordinary people. Um, so, yeah, that was what... That was the study into social psychology from the 50s up until the 2000s when the oligarchs, the elites, the cabal, whoever you want to call them, they hijacked the whole field and they began to use it for their benefit to be able to collect data on all of the people using big tech, for instance. And that began, that began the whole psychological profiling of the population. And it became... Um, really big, it became a problem for the governments because the governments were losing control to big tech because big tech had all this data, this data science. And um, they, were having, they were having more control over the population than the government were. So the government trying to find a solution to it, or the governments. And along came um, a book called Nudge. And Nudge came out in 2008 and it uh, changed the game, completely changed the game. It was written by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. And it gave governments a framework of how to use psychological tools to manipulate populations. They changed the name from behavioral science to nudge because um, nudge was more marketable because everybody can remember nudge. Uh, and um, before long, governments were starting to use it. They were starting to get great benefits, and uh, it started to swing the pendulum back towards the government in order for them to have regain control over the populations. Now, Thaler and Sunstein, uh, they present themselves as two avuncular kind of professors, and they're just trying to help humanity, all that stuff. Right? But once they went big, once this book went big, they became consultants for all of the big governments around the world. They consulted Obama. They consulted David Cameron. Um, they, you know, almost have an office in the UK government. Trudeau, 
Uh, all the usual suspects, Australia, you know, they're fully on board with the Nudge unit, but Thaler and S Sunstein, they're the guys that go in and set up the Nudge units and have them running these psychological operations against the population so they can be manipulated. They manipulate their choices, basically. That's how they do it. So they will limit the choices, or they call it the choice architecture, so that they know what your field of choices are and they know how to nudge you towards the choice that they want you to make and slowly but surely they'll remove the other choices quite dark um it's done without importantly it's done without informed consent because what's happening is a psychological experiment is being conducted on the population and it's being done with subterfuge and cunning and sneakiness and they're not telling us that they're doing it Right? And therefore, there's no informed consent. So, you know, we've got a very strong argument to push back against this. Here's a little interview with Thala and Sunstein. Well, what I feel excited about is uh, the chance that private and public organizations will use the book to make people's lives easier and longer. So in the government sphere, we think that uh, it's a lot to say some nudges can save the planet, uh, but we can make air and water cleaner and do a lot about the climate change problem with a few simple nudges. Yeah, in some ways I think what we're, we're sort of aiming for the Holy Grail. And we don't claim to deliver the Holy Grail, but we offer maybe a glimpse of the Holy Grail. The politics in this country has gotten so unbelievably polarized when people read the book, they are surprised at both how left-wing and right-wing we seem to be simultaneously, and that confuses some readers. It's often thought that there's an inevitable conflict between either markets or mandates, and we don't think that you need mandates, and we think you can use markets but sort of grease the skids and make it more likely that markets lead to outcomes that make people better off. So you can hear them there talking about climate change, how to nudge people towards it. Um, one of the ideas, key ideas of nudge is that there's no mandates, which means that they don't, um, they don't force you to do anything, right? Because they need consent, right? So what they do is nudge you rather than forcing you. Yeah, because um, they always need to manufacture consent and that's how they nudge you towards the decision that they want you to take. Um, it's um, because when a big decision, they need a big decision and they try and force you into doing it, it reveals their hand and it gives you the opportunity to push back and revolt because you can see it as tyranny. So they do it in a sly, shady way. Of course, they do it in a slight shady way. Uh, oh, and just for the avoidance of doubt, I've checked the early life of Thala and Sunstein, and I can confirm that they're not Christians. Um, now, Thala is massively in demand. Yeah, and this is his website. And let me just try and find it because I've got a million websites that I'm trying to manage. There we go. Yeah, so this is his website. And this is called the Professor of Behavioral Science and Economics. So what he does is he goes in and uh, he goes in and sets up behavioral science and um, departments. That's it, the behavioral insights team. So when you see Western governments, they'll have a behavioral insights department that's being set up by Thala, right? And he is there making sure that the right people are hired, the right doctrine is enforced and deployed and it's unified you know it's unified from this one guy on this board the people that are working with him uh, i'm trying to find his um there's a way to find out what governments he's involved with but i couldn't find it on the site but he's involved with a load of governments and in the uk it's not like there's one nudge department there's a nudge department in every department there's nudge departments in the welsh government there's nudge departments in the scottish government so while, while at the moment we're seeing all these weird, like, government policies. I've still got a cold, you'd have to excuse me. 
um, why we've seen all these weird behavioural policies. Um, it's all coming from the different nudge departments who are trying to manipulate the population into where they want to put us. Now, um, it, one of the funniest ones I've seen here is how the tax office use a nudge department in order to get you to comply, to pay the tax bill when it comes in or order, in order for you to pay on time. Uh, watch this. What other motivations do people have for paying tax? One thing that's really important is what other people are doing. The vast majority of people are paying their tax on time. So if we just told people that... So this guy works for the tax department's nudge unit. Told the people that are currently not paying on time, would that make people think, oh, oh hang on, I am in the minority, I should go on and, and pay taxes. And that's exactly what we did. There's a letter, people have an outstanding debt with the tax authority. We send them a letter saying nine out of ten people pay their tax on time you know, you are in the minority that does not pay their tax on time. And then because we've got the data and we randomize, i.e. we send this letter I described to a randomly selected group and the original letter to another randomly selected group, we can measure whether the sort of amended letter actually makes more people pay their tax on time. And indeed it does. Not only that, but we can go further. Okay, well, you matter. it matters to you what everyone in the country is doing, but really what matters to you is what your neighbors are doing, right? And this is a much closer social link. So we had another letter which said, nine out of 10 people in your local area pay their tax on time. Even more than that, we had nine out of 10 people with a debt like yours pay their tax on time. And then the final, and this is the order of how effective they were, the final one, which was nine out of 10 people with a debt like yours in your area pay their tax on time. This was the most effective. And that took about, so originally people are receiving this letter, 33% or around a third still go on to pay their tax and this increased it to 39%. This trial and a whole host of others in our first sort of batch of work at the tax office brought forward more than 200 million pounds in the first 12 months. And that really gave us the momentum and clearly raising tax is very important, but kind of gave us the momentum in other departments to actually go and try new approaches. <laughs> so telling you like me from the horse's mouth from the tax department itself telling you how they're using it but the you know admitting to using psychology to manipulate the population without telling them they're doing it right so um we've definitely got something to say about this and then here we see the government must support behavior change to meet climate targets <laughs> right so they're just out in the open only out in the open if you know how to analyze the text if you know what's behind it because they're talking to each other they know right this is like coded language they know exactly what they're saying to each other it's just that we're in the dark because they don't tell us about this shit the government must support behavior change to meet climate targets so that means that they know that people don't want to go down this whole climate nonsense Right, because it just involves more control, more tax, more surveillance, more authoritarianism, and we know where that's taking us, and we're resisting it. So they have to change our behavior. They have to change our behavior in order to get the decision that they want, not what we want. Uh, yeah, so um, this one here is interesting. This is a deleted government report that celebrates how the public loves to conform. Um, climate change technocrats plan on using the same methods that convince the public to obey lockdown. A deleted government report exploring how to make the public alter its behavior to accept the new green economy reveals how COVID-19 restrictions have created a population with a deep set reverence for authority and a powerful tendency to conform. The report was inadvertently published by the British government before being hastily pulled down, but numerous journalists were able to retrieve its contents. The document explored how to weaponize behavioral psychology to nudge the public into supporting measures and adopting behavior without them explicitly knowing they're being manipulated. The investigation found that the same techniques the government used to force people into accepting lockdown could be used to make them change their lifestyles in the name of preventing climate change. Under the heading, Principles for Successful Behavior, the paper noted, government statements, actions and laws powerfully shape perceptions of normative and acceptable behavior. 
For instance, even with public criticism being high, many still perceive government approval as the yardstick for safe behavior during COVID-19. We're allowed to do this now, so it must be safe. This reveals for many a deep set reverence for legitimate government authority, regardless of one's personal political views, which was demonstrated by how high the Labour support party jumped when Boris asked them to, or all the Labour supporters, you know, we hate the Tories, but the Tories were, you know, had them the runaround. They were telling them to do all these restrictions and uh, they just went along with it. So, yeah, it goes on. It's a long article, but it's definitely worth looking at. It's um, it's definitely worth looking at. So it's a nudge. The problems with it are like it gives a godlike assumption to <laughs> the authorities that the government knows best and you just need to go along with it. Um, there's no informed consent. It's constant experiments without the population giving its consent. It's using techniques on massive groups without consultation. It's propagandists for dictatorships. It's no, responsi uh, no responsibility for outcomes. It's anti-democratic and run by elites. It pushes bad products and bad policies without regards to ethics. So other people have, um, who are analyzing Nudge, some academics and PhDs and stuff, um, they're comparing it to Marxism, of course. <laughs> Marxism is founded on the belief the base, the economy, uh, is going to influence the um, superstructure. Um, the Marxist idea is that if you change the economy, then you change how people experience government, family, education, religion, and ideas and culture and things like that. So um, wealthy, wealthier people would that they are able to influence the superstructure and then therefore that will influence um, how the society operates. Well, look at the new um, behavioral politics of how that works. So now I've noticed Thaler's actually and Sunstein are talking about economics as the foundation of public policy. So no longer just a research discipline, but it's actually the foundation of public policy. So there's no longer, you know, laissez-faire capitalism or welfare state or whatever. Um, their view now is that the public policy is a behavioral economic policy. You know, they were, I think, extremely influential in the Obama um, period. They worked with Cameron in the UK. Um, they're obviously working in Australia now. Um, I'm not sure Canada, but it's, I dare say it's probably the same with Trudeau. This behavioral economics they see is going to change behavioral a psychology to nudge people. So again, it seems to me like there's a bit of an argument that it's Marxism by another name, and it's definitely, definitely, definitely central planning of government, albeit based on a kind of a psychological profile of society. I think this is extremely scary. I think anyone who values freedom and liberty should be quite worried about where this is all leading. Yeah. So what he's arguing there is that it's the it becomes behavioral economics. It's economics run by behavioral nudging, and that centralizes more and more power into smaller and smaller hands, and it becomes a government of authoritarianism. And, and I, I think that's becoming more and more difficult to deny because um, it seems as if the heads of these governments now no longer fear the electorate because they seem to have figured out how to manipulate elections, whether that's through rigged elections or nudging the population where they need to go in order to get the government that they want, you know? So um, it, they're becoming more distant to the population, more autocratic, uh, less fear of the population because, <laughs> like they said, we're, you know, love to conform and we're compliant. Well, not all of us, um, but... To give a little insight into Thala, who is the guy behind the nudge book, he's the guy that's running all these consultancies, he's setting up all the nudge units, and he sells himself as, you know, I'm an avuncular professor, and uh, I just want to help humanity. Uh, let's have a little look at him here, talking about his opinion on nudge during COVID. Wondering about what you think has been different about government's response across the world to the pandemic uh, because of nudge? There was certainly a lot of nudging going on and not just by the government. In the private sector, if you would go out to a shop, there were rules about how many people could be inside at one time, but most shop owners took a very bit of simple technology. They would take a piece of blue tape and put it on the ground 
two meters apart, that's the nudge to be socially distant. Behavior led government. Some governments have been more successful than others. We've all been blessed by the miracle of the vaccines. In the initial period, there was quite a bit of sludge. How much are you going to try to direct who goes first versus get as many shots in arms as fast as possible? Make it easy. You know, my mantra, that was the key to stage one. Even more important in stage two, which was getting the people who weren't clamoring for the shot, make it as easy as possible for them. We're now in the United States getting to the third stage or are well into the third stage where we're dealing with people who have very strong opinions that they should not get a vaccine. We are past the point of nudging when it comes to the vaccine. Raise your hand if you're one of those people. <laughs> right. So there, there you have it. You know, they, they, they talk openly about it because they don't think we're going to watch this stuff. But um, yeah, so there you, there you hear it from the horse's mouth. When they talk about nudging, right, it sounds like safe and friendly and it's just a little guide here, but it's actually sophisticated, dark, malevolent, psychological ploys in order to get people to do what they want. And during COVID, when he was talking about make it easy for them, they make it easy for people by creating fear, mass fear, and limiting the choices, limiting the choices, keep taking the choices away until all that's left is a binary option or an option where you can't refuse. Like, you know, if you, you can't come back to your job unless you take the vaccine, that's not forcing you to take the vaccine, but it's giving you limited choices. Whereas if you don't accept it, then the consequences might be quite harsh for you. So they created this mass fear, this nudge unit during COVID created this mass fear and, you know, fantastically is being summed up in this book. How the UK government weaponized fear during the COVID-19 pandemic. This is a book about fear. Fear of a virus. Fear of death. Fear of losing our jobs, our democracy, our human connections, our health, and our minds. It's also about how the government weaponized our fear against us, supposedly in our best interests, until we were one of the most frightened countries in the world. A State of Fear by Laura Dodsworth. It's about fear of a virus, fear of death, fear of infection, fear of losing our jobs, our culture, the economy, even our minds. But most of all, it's about how the UK government weaponized fear to make us follow the rules. Even if it was supposedly in our best interests, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we were scared into submission. The book starts with Fright Night, as I call it, which is the night that Boris Johnson told us we must stay at home. And it takes you through one year of the behavioral science nudge and fear mongering approach to the pandemic. So there you have it. So that's what they did is they created this mass fear for the population because when someone's afraid, they're far easier to manipulate. And um, it was so successful that Thaler's nudge units have been installed everywhere. And since COVID, there is just a proliferation of these places and we need to become aware of them. We need to see when nudges in operation. For instance, um, when they said they were going to announce, uh, when they announced the 15-minute city trial in Oxford, they already told the population in Oxford that this is the decision we've already made. What happened to democracy, which was a conversation where we discuss and debate ideas and then the consensus would win the day because it would be the most logical choice. No, 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 no. Now they've made a decision and they're going to guide us to it and they're going to guide us to consenting. 
Well, they think they will. And I think more people are kind of seeing through what's happening and are pushing back. And I think that's what we need to do is as you become more aware of nudge yourself, I hope that um, you go away and do some further research on this. But we've got to start speaking about it to our peers, our colleagues, writing to your MP to say, can you tell us about the nudge unit? Where are my taxes? My taxes are being spent on psychological operations to be used against me. Right. So your taxes are being used against you. Of course, they always are. But your MP should have to answer about the nudge unit. What's going on in there? Because apparently there's tons of nudge psychological profiling going on in the government and the secret programs as well that they're not revealing. They may be forced to reveal with um an foi but we saw recently with the whole spying operation that the government were forced to admit during covid when the 77th brigade were spying on the british public that was to create a profile to understand the psychology of what was happening to insert narratives to try and manipulate the narrative to push us in the direction they wanted to go that was all nudge and it's um something that we have to become aware of because it's only going to get worse and worse and worse. And I think all of the topics that we discussed today will demonstrate some elements of nudge. Um, it's probably as old as the hills, you know, the <laughs> government's manipulating populations to do what they want, but it's becoming sophisticated. It's becoming a dark art in which they can um, predict results accurately each and every time, especially now the population has been conditioned. Maybe that's what one of the reasons of COVID was. It was mass conditioning in order to prepare the population for further psychological operations that use the same techniques against the population.